excited this year to have co-moderators for our legislative panel. And what I really appreciate about this, I say this all the time, Mike and Julie, I say all the time, when we go out, the ability to have good public discourse is more and more challenging each and every day. The ability for us to go out and talk across the aisle, the ability for us to be able to have a, an agreement to disagree on things, but then have a cordial and collegial relationship. And our co-moderators today are the epitome of that. If you ever get to see the article that they do together, a little point and counterpoint, it's phenomenal because we know that they come from two different philosophies of how they advance policy in the state of New Jersey, and yet their ability to work together to move the needle is unprecedented. So I'd like to introduce, who will then introduce our panel, Mike Duhame, who's the partner at Mercury Public Affairs LLC and a top GOP strategist, and his co-moderator, our legislative discussion leader, Julie Virginsky, who's the president of Optimist Communications and a Democratic political consultant, and they're going to introduce the panel. So take it away, folks. Um, I, I guess, I'm be can everybody hear me? Um, on behalf of Mike and myself, I guess I want to thank everybody for inviting us, first of all, for everybody joining us. Um, and I you can, should hear our private discourse. It's right. Not it's nearly, not nearly as cordial. Um, <laughs> as a, just a point of personal privilege, I, I'm looking at Frank Robinson from the New Jersey Business Industry Association, who um, is a real, has been a real mentor to me throughout my career. I know that he's retiring in the next couple weeks, so I didn't necessarily say to get up, but uh, acknowledge Frank and everything that he's done for a lot of people in this room, me included. Um, I, I guess I'll, do you want me to introduce the Democrats and yep. you can introduce the Republicans? I'll start with, to my right, Sen Senator Sweeney, Senate President Sweeney. Um, probably the most powerful Senate president that I um, have seen in my lifetime, certainly here in New Jersey, I'm not sure, uh, possibly in history. Um, a huge advocate for working families, a huge advocate for fiscal responsibility in the state, and uh, a huge advocate for his members and his caucus and, and the state of New Jersey. So to my right, Senator Sweeney. And, uh, To my left, uh, Assembly Majority Leader Lee Greenwald, a great friend, um, also a big mentor to me, um, somebody who has fought for very innovative ways, and I'm freelancing this, but just from personal experience, innovative ways to really make our state much more affordable and, and really out of the box thinking. Sometimes he comes up with ideas that I think are fantastic, and sometimes we have to go back to the drawing board, but they're always very innovative. And um, a huge mentor as well to, to me, so. First, uh, Senator Kane, who uh, has, a, has a great uh, source of pride for me, and my, my senator, and uh, uh, in a great uh, sense of uh, constituent service. One of my first weeks uh, when I was living in his district, uh, uh, Hurricane Irene came through, or Tropical Storm Irene came through, blows through, I had two feet of water in my basement, and trees were down all over, nobody could get around town, and on a bicycle came my state senator to come and help me. So I thought that was tremendous constituent service. I'm not sure if <laughs> That on stage, but <laughs> and Tom has been a, a great leader uh, for the Republican caucus and, and certainly uh, is one who st stood up uh, for fiscal sanity in the state for many years, uh, working uh, with Governor Christie, uh, standing up to some of Governor Murphy's policies, and I think he's really been a great leader for the caucus as well. And I'm lucky to have him as my senator, lucky to have him here. Thank you. And so I'm Governor DeMeo, I, I think, uh, adds a great deal to the discourse in, in Trenton because of his uh, array of, uh, of uh, experience uh, in government. He's someone who's been a councilman. I, I think he's told me 24 years old, mayor of Hackettstown, freeholder, uh, and obviously now in the assembly and the, uh, the assembly budget officer on the Republican side. So I think that wide range of experience is really helpful uh, in Washington, excuse me, in Trenton, especially when it comes to understanding uh, what happens on State Street and how it can affect Main Street in a town. I think that's really helpful discourse, uh, helpful perspective. So, thanks. so thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to just get right to it. I'm going to start with you, Senator Sweeney. We are in lame duck. It is an interesting lame duck <coughs> session, to say the least. Um, a couple of innovative ideas that you've introduced that I've been reading about. What can we expect? Well, it is lame. <laughs> I don't think it's lame. I think it's pretty interesting, but okay. This is probably the scariest time of the year. But, uh, look, there's a... There's a lot of work we still need to do to make New Jersey more affordable. Uh, I'm tired of talking about tax increases. I want to start talking about how we fix things. Uh, Path to progress is one of the things we've been pushing for quite some time. And 
as this session ends doesn't mean we're not going to start up next session with a very aggressive push to start moving things. Um, just to follow up on that, there was a package of 27 bills announced um, last May with respect to Path to Progress. What's the status? Are you going to try to push any specific components or? We're going to try to push it all. Okay. And, you know, Julie, these are the things that, you know, when we put the panel together, they were really the who's who of New Jersey government, uh, tax policy, you know, they're just, it was bipartisan. There was no formal legislation done. At, you know, at Tony, God rest his soul, Tony Bucco served on it with us, uh, senior, others. You know, we pick up the phone, hey, can I be part of it? And Tom and I discussed it. We made sure it was completely bipartisan. And these are all the things we've always known needs, that actually need to get done. They're the hard things. All the easy things are done. There's nothing left but the tough things that actually are, are the ones that are actually going to make real savings. School consolidation, I can't tell you how much I hear from different people in schools, well, we'll do it if you make us. Well, if you know it's right, just do it. And believe it or not, I've been meeting with different school districts, plural, that are talking about this and they're excited because we got $10 million in the budget for surveys and studies. I met in Salem County with mayors for three hours and school boards for three hours. And after two and a half hours of telling me why they're against something, they don't know what exists. You know, it's like, well, how can you be against something? I didn't give you anything yet. You know, so we're actually going to do a study if I can get the grant for Salem County to create a countywide school system. And it's the right size. I got to look. Real quick numbers. Vineland, 11,000 kids, their budget's 180 million. Salem County's got less than 11,000 kids, their budget's 226 million. So, we're, no, we're not, we're not, I don't shy away from things, as you know. Yep. Uh, I'll ask you, uh, you mentioned Path to Progress, I guess I'll ask members of the Assembly, do you think, uh, do you think it moves in the Assembly? Uh, there, there certainly is a lot of good points to the Path to Progress. I mean, obviously, doing things the same way we've done them over the past 30 or 40 years is not economically feasible anymore. If there's ways to consolidate schools, if, if children, and I agree with Senate President on the K through 12s, if they're going to end up going to the same high school, there's a lot of sense to bring them together, and that's that's a that I would think be one of the easiest steps uh, to to do, quite frankly, uh, short of sorting out who has more debt and how do you integrate that kind of stuff. But certainly, there's a lot of points in the path of progress that make sense, uh, but the K through 12 is probably top on the list that I would uh, I would be. Uh, an advocate for. Yeah, I, listen, I was very proud to be on the Path to Progress task force that worked on it, myself and, and our budget chairwoman, Eliana Pintermarin, uh, participated in every session. We were very proud that it was done in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, you know, I tell people all the time, Senator Orho, I think has distinguished himself in New Jersey in government and politics because he came to the forefront with us a few years ago when we stepped out to, to fix a broken, bankrupt transportation trust fund. Steve was not afraid of the conversation, a very needed conversation around addressing the gasoline and fuel tax in New Jersey, to fund infrastructure development in New Jersey, where our roads and bridges by the National Association of Engineers had ranked as a D plus. But Steve uh, Orho, along with Steve Sweeney and myself, said if we're going to have this conversation, let's have a conversation around tax balance and tax fairness. And we tinkered around the edges and pilot programs in a way that would make New Jersey competitive by eliminating certain estate and inheritance taxes, by looking at pensionable income up to $100,000. When we saw New Jerseyans in retirement leave to go to other states that had those tax benefits. So we tried in a very real way to do tax balance, at the same time creating uh, a foundation for infrastructure that would attract business, grow business, and create economic vitality. That really is in many respects what I think Senate President Sweeney and myself, when we worked on this path to progress, was, was the attempt and the goal. There were hundreds of bills that came out of path to progress, literally hundreds. And partly that was because when we, ta when we challenged the task force, what we said to them was, be bold. Tell us what is happening in other states. We didn't say just give us politically plausible ideas or things that would sell. Give us ideas that would be bold. 
uh, I think any member on this, com on this panel, Steve and myself, have said publicly, we're not telling you that they're all pearls that came out of the task force, but they stimulated debate. The ones that we are advocating for, like streamlining school systems, saving hundreds of millions of dollars, six, seven hundred million dollars, uh, an administrative cost without and putting more money into the classroom with our children which stimulates our, our foundation of why people have moved to New Jersey in many respects to take advantage of a world-class public education system was really the purpose of this. Um, I think Steve and I, we've said it publicly, I'll say it again, we're not telling you every idea that came out of Path to Progress is something that we would move. But the ones that you've seen have bill numbers. The ones that we are moving through the legislature are ones that uh, we do support. And I'll just close with, you know, we've had conversations with the governor in his front office. He has indicated that he supports a number of these bills as well. And I think we need to get to the table with folks and put some of our, you know, petty uh, bickering aside and really focus on what's in the best interest of the state. And I know Steve and I are ready and willing to do that. Senator Kane, that's a good jumping off point to uh, uh, some thoughts about controlling spending, controlling taxes. There's a survey done by uh, NJBIA among its members, and uh, some numbers jump out as somewhat staggering. 89% of the members of, of uh, NJBIA, the business community, believe New Jersey does a worse job of controlling taxes and fees than other states, and 79% say New Jersey's worse in controlling government spending than other states nearby. And as you might not be surprised, given that it's New Jersey, some people chose colorful language in some of the responses as well. Um, just in a general sense, uh, is there a way out? Is there a way out, uh, whether it's path to progress or other ways, is there a way out from uh, this historically uh, that we do with? Well, we have to control the affordability problem that exists for every resident in New Jersey, regardless of the zip code. And things like the 2% cap uh, did a lot of great progress. We should not increase spending on, on the state level because every year you can have a massive change. I mean, two years ago, there was a massive, uh, what, 7% uh, increase in, in spending from one year to the next. And that created, I mean, between the various tax proposals and everything else, that created a lot of uh, unpredictability for a lot of people. Now, now last year, Governor Murphy proposed a budget that had $600 million of tax increases and on a bipartisan basis we worked to say, and it didn't include increases in special education um, funding, it didn't include um, money for New Jersey Transit, it didn't include a lot of priorities, it didn't include funding for when the minimum wage increase did go through for the responsibilities within state government to, for some of those services. Um, so the legislature on a bipartisan basis was able to get together and say, let's not increase taxes, let's not do this and have a better approach and not increase spending by more than 2%. But the problem you have is when you have an inconsistent spending rate and a tax, you know, when people are talking about increasing income taxes, sales taxes, <coughs> corporate business taxes, a variety of other things, whether they actually get increased or not, people send that message around, around the, not only around the country, but around the globe. And individuals say, what am I gonna do to make sure I can afford to, to, to retire, I can afford to be close to my grandkids, whatever the decision point they are in their, in their life, Unfortunately, too many of those individuals look to Pennsylvania, which is like the number one out migration state for people in New Jersey, and that's not because of the weather, right? That's because of the predictable tax climate. And so what we have to do is when we look around to other states that actually do it right, when you look to Massachusetts, or you look to North Carolina, or you look to Virginia, you look to some of these other states, they've got a consistent higher education and investment infrastructure program that is you know, year in, year out, regardless of what the party's affiliations of the people who lead the state are. They have a consistent income tax rate from year in and year out. They have a, a consistent pr program to make sure that um, there's, there's predictability over time. And so what happens is people are able to say, I'm going to invest in that state over time because I know in five years they're not going to change the tax code. And what's happening right now, and they're not going to increase spending in these massive ways people have seen in this state over the years. And so when, you, when you've got to first and foremost say, if there's a constitutional amendment way, for example, just like we did the 2% cap a couple years ago on, on municipal and, and schools and others, if we have a 2% constitutional cap, ways to control the cost of spending, you're, you're able to have a predictable approach over time, and then you also, after that, need to have consistent economic investment programs, consistent education funding formulas, consistent tax policies over time. And that's what will make sure that that level of certainty 
for more than a five-year period, is what, which will help make sure that there's investment in New Jersey over time. You know, jumping off on that, um, you're talking about predictability, which brings me to um, discussions that we've had about the economic incentive programs that have been in the news, obviously, for, for quite a while this year. Um, we've now gone six months without a tax incentive program, and I guess I'll start with you, Assemblyman Greenwald. It's in your neck of the woods that's been getting the most attention on it. What are the challenges facing business? Um, Senator Kane talked about predictability, but we've gone now six months without one. We keep hearing there may be an agreement soon. Um, can you first shed some light on that, whether that's true? Um, and secondly, whether uh, this has affected our business climate because of the uncertainty that Senator Kane was talking about. Well, as you know, one of the top five uh, most influential elected leaders in the state, I would tell you I'm very disappointed that, in my personal opinion, I have not had enough interaction with the front office on their next phases of the tax incentive program. Um, I, can, I won't speak for my friend Steve. I know Steve and I have been uh, individually uh, very focused on this. Um, and Steve and I, along with our speaker and our friends in the Republican Party, are very committed to trying to find a program that works for New Jersey. Um, I am not a believer that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I think in my, this, I'm entering my 25th year in the state legislature. This is the only office I've ever held. I will tell you in my 25 years, the legislation that we've done in bipartisan fashion is the best legislation that I've done in my career. I think of uh, legislation on auto insurance reform, cancer research and development, and uh, most recently, the higher ed merger that we did that really put Rutgers and merged in the Cancer Institute of New Jersey on the map. Most recently, the tax incentive program has been, in my humble opinion, a success. And I define success as a city like Camden that had an infant mortality rate that rivaled a third world nation, a median income of $22,000 a year, 87% uh, of their public schools were chronically failing. The residents of that city, if you make $22,000 a year, are by definition prisoners of poverty. And they don't have the luxury that you and I have if we're not happy with our school system, take our children to another school, move to another community. When you make $22,000 a year, for all the reasons that Tom talked about that I agree with 100%, it is very hard to find an affordable place to live and give your children a chance to succeed. So we created a foundation where in Camden County, we created a Camden County police force. We attacked home rule uh, with a, a direct shot to the heart. Nobody lost an election. Uh, crime rates in Camden City amongst violent crime and all crime reduced by over 50%. We invested in urban renaissance schools, charter schools, and public education in the city of Camden, and education levels for all children across the board rose up. And then the final piece of the puzzle as we built that foundation and invested in infrastructure was the Economic Opportunity Act that we worked on with Governor Christie. And there were lots of negotiations that went into that. It wasn't okay, yes, it was back and forth and give and take and what had failed under previous economic incentive programs. And with that, we had companies relocate from other states and companies from Pennsylvania, like the Philadelphia 76ers, come and set up their entire sense of operation in the city of Camden. And yes, we had companies that were in New Jersey, including companies that were in my district, like Subaru of America, that had outgrown their footprint in Cherry Hill and were being wooed to go to the Naval Yard in Philadelphia, elect to stay in Camden County, elect to stay in South Jersey, elect to stay in New Jersey, and build a state-of-the-art facility in Camden City. What we've seen with that is, in my 52 years of life, the city of Camden was the birthplace of my mother, and for many of us who live down there, whether we represent it or not, it is, a, it is a historic component of our state, and it is an economic driver of our region. What we saw after we invest in the Economic Opportunity Act with the benefits of crime reform, education reform, and infrastructure reform, President Obama came to the city of Camden and in a bipartisan fashion with myself and Steve and many other of our leaders along with Governor Christie held Camden City up as a national model of urban redevelopment. That's a success story. Uh, how do you define success? Kids are doing better in school. Crime rates are down. People are moving into the city. We're building workforce housing 
not moderate affordable housing, workforce housing for young millennials for the first time in my lifetime in the city of Camden. So is it perfect? It is not perfect. Rarely anything that comes from public policy is perfect. It is a foundational point from which to build. So I share Governor Murphy's desire to invest in entrepreneurial economic development programs. I share Governor Murphy's vision to invest in small business economic incentive grants. But I would not do that at the exclusion of some of the other economic opportunity grants that have been successful, nor would I stay with the program that we have now without investing in small business and entrepreneurial. It is a bottom-up, top-down approach that ultimately works, but you, you have to start somewhere. And you know, for me, President Obama was what I refer to when my parents used to talk about President Kennedy. That was my Kennedy moment. I was very proud to have worked with him on, on health care reform that stimulated our economy in New Jersey, that registered over 600,000 people that didn't have insurance before. But when someone like President Obama comes to Camden City with the history that we have had and says this is a national model, national model for urban redevelopment, we're on to something. And we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And our goal, I'll just close with this, our goal was not to just save Camden, but that if we could fix Camden, Trenton would be easy. Atlantic City would be easy. Patterson would be easy. And, and, you know, just, and I apologize. The, the, the questions are not simple answers, and I, I apologize. And hopefully this improves your statistics of so many people who hate what's going on in New Jersey. When we did the education reform, we didn't do education. We didn't offer Renaissance schools to Camden. We offered them to Camden, Trenton, Newark, Patterson, numerous cities across the state. Camden took advantage of it. Camden's numbers are up. Now other cities that have been given the opportunity are looking at it, and other cities that weren't included are asking to join. That's success. That is a successful event in public policy, and that's our hope. So, Senator Sweeney, um, Senator Assemblyman Greenwell just obviously gave a very full-throated defense of this program. The governor says that um, you're, there's an agreement that's nearby. I assume you'd be the person he'd be. There's no agreement. Okay. It's not close. Uh, there doesn't mean that we can't come to an agreement, but as people know, I am not someone who's going to say something that is not true whether it's positive or politically correct. Look, I, I believe, I agree with the governor of venture capital investment. The problem is, we're not investing in the universities, I saw that slide, where all the venture capital is taking place. Because we don't have the revenue to make the investment. Because we're not willing to reform the things we need to reform to come up with the dollars to invest in different places, Julie. There is not a chance that I will support a total cap of the EDA program. Here's the fact. Governor Murphy, I see the executive director here, appointed by Governor Murphy. Good to see you, Ms. Selvin. Uh, he's appointed the chair, and he has veto authority over the EDA. He's already capped it unofficially. In the last two years, they've done about $400 million in incentives, and by all means, he's, he has every right to do that. But to put a cap on, when you have mega projects that are trying to come to Newark, they won't come because they know that Newark isn't the only one that's going to get the incentives. It's a statewide program. And they should be evaluated. I, I had asked Senator Carrillos and former Senator Carrillos and Senator Lesniak, who really are the guys that have done this for the last 30 years, to work on a bill. But when I read that we're close, I'm sorry. You're speaking for me, and we're not. And we have to stop what we've done to this incentive program, because who the hell wants to even go through it now? I have business people that called me up. I built the building. I hired twice as many people. They won't give me my money. My bank's calling. My bank's calling. What do I do? I went into business with the government the state of New Jersey. I went and made a deal with you. You're not honoring the deal. And you know, if anyone's cheated, they should be held accountable. 
we should, we should not just take the money back. They should be interested in penalties and whatever has to be done legally or law enforcement be done. But we made a spectacle of our incentive program and people don't want to be here now. You know, and, and the frustration is how do you reverse that? Remember when we had beep and we stopped giving them money and we worked to give them a credit? Because we don't have a good track record here in New Jersey of telling businesses to come here and this is what you're offered. Oh, and by the way, the other thing for me, there's no way I'm going for a five-year program because you're not getting investment over on a five-year deal. You have to make it a minimum of 10. So the points that I absolutely would agree, like Lewis said, I absolutely agree with the governor and willing to work with him, but there's points where I'm not going to sacrifice my beliefs because I want a strong program that creates investment because I'm in the, I'm in the iron working business. That's what I do for a living. It's drying up. Investment is slowing down. And, and we know a recession is coming. Probably after the presidential, I'm willing to bet you. Not before, because you know, look, what, what president would let a recession happen right before the election? If he has the ability to juice it by interest rate cuts and everything. But at the end of the day, we need an incentive program. And I tell people all the time, Northern New Jersey is a lot easier to bring businesses out in New York because we're cheaper. The reason why we did what we did in the 2013 bill is because Philadelphia has a thing called the Keystone Enterprise Zone. And if you don't believe that doesn't work, go by where Eagle Stadium is, where the Naval Yard is, and see all these beautiful big buildings that have been built. They're from businesses from here, a lot of them. Subaru of America, Lewis Sites, not maybe going to the Navy Yard, absolutely going to the Navy Yard. And American Water was the same thing because it was more attractive. We, you know, we are one state, but different regions of the state have different challenges. And look, it's cheaper in New Jersey than North Jersey, New York. It's not cheaper where we live. I was in Harrisburg just earlier this week, and they were talking all about the Navy Yard in Philadelphia and how it's yeah. exploding. That was a big talk between Philadelphia folks and Harrisburg folks. Well, Michael, when you say it, just go buy it. You know, I'm, I'm going to have the iron workers in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. My guys in Pennsylvania are doing great. You know what I mean? That Navy Yard's on fire. But if we don't have an incentive program, who's coming here? Because we're a high-tax state. You know, Governor Kane cited it the best of anybody. Tom, he, your father said, it's like we're paying extortion to bring jobs here because we're such a bad tax policy state. You have to give the huge pork chop to get the dog to play with you. You know what I mean? Really, it's, it's, we got to reverse this at some point. I believe he said it, the, the key to business in New Jersey was having your taxes be a little bit lower than Philadelphia, a little bit lower than New York. It seems like yeah. that's reversed. It, 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 and that's what is unfortunate for people who are looking around Pennsylvania when they're looking at New York. I mean, only Connecticut has a less stable tax structure and business opportunity than, than, than does New Jersey. And you see what's happening in that state. We've got to have a, a climate that is better. We've got to have a tax climate that's better than our peers. We've got to have predictability over time. I've been pushing a charitable deduction bill. It's a bill that we passed on the Senate on a bipartisan basis, 39 to 0 is now in the Assembly. I hope we can get that done in lame duck so that, that the charities and the nonprofits who are the incredible you know, energy of a lot of the local uh, communities and, and um, areas, I hope we can get that done. We've got to continue to focus on um, commutability because it's not just a tax structure, it's also the ability to commute around the state. And when you look at New Jersey Transit and a number of other places, I mean, people right now feel that the state is uncommunable in too many different ways. So you've got to have predictability. You've got to have communication by New Jersey Transit. You've got to have a tax policy, whether it's the incentive program that deals with a 10-year program, and you know, and, and I agree that there shouldn't be caps on the, on the program overall. You've got to make sure you've got a, an innovative program. Just, just yesterday, um, the administration announced a, bill, a first grant for a postdoc research individual. It was a piece of legislation I got through the legislature last year or two years ago. We we're actually trying to bring in an industrial research scientist and keep them in the state over time. We've got to focus on innovation. We've got to focus on manufacturing. We've got to focus on ways to make sure that everybody at every income and every age bracket can stay in the state. But it does mean that you've got to outcompete 
our neighboring states. We've also got to outcompete Virginia and North Carolina now as well. Mm -hmm. Senator DeMayo, we talked. Oh. Just, just uh, a couple of points on this. Um, I see where the governor wants to reduce the amount of money that goes to incentives, but my fear is the other money that would have been given out in tax incentives is going to get lost in the budget. So this is, in my mind, a, 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 a big issue. Uh, we need a plan. I happen to believe that it needs to be more like a, a targeted rifle to the highest level of new types of businesses, less money. But the main reason we need these incentives is we are such a high tax state. If you look at what North Carolina did, simultaneous to our 2013 Economic Opportunity Act, North Carolina rewrote their CBT laws. They were at 6.9% at that time, immediately went to six. And then as they hit revenue projections, if they hit, I think it was 20 billion, 200 million, they took it to 5%. Then they had to be about 800 million more and they took it to 4%. Currently, North Carolina's corporate business tax is 3%. That type of program, if we could find a way to do it, would help all businesses in the room equally. In my real world, I'd have no CBT. We'd have more employees that they would pay taxes in the gross income tax, and we'd have businesses flourishing here. We are so positioned between New York and Philadelphia. We should be the powerhouse of the region. I don't know why businesses from New York don't want to site satellites in New Jersey, because quite frankly, the heck with crossing the tunnel and crossing the river. Be here, pay, pay income taxes here. But the reality is our taxes are so high, we're not competitive, forget our region. But North Carolina is taking companies from us as we sit here. And if we don't become more competitive on that tax rate, we are gonna to continue to sort of shotgun approach, put a little here, I'm, I'm happy for Camden, and believe me, I'm tickled to death for Camden. I think that's a great success story. But we really need to, we're, we're at the, nearly the bottom, 47th, I believe, in, 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 in business climate in the country. We consistently lag in GDP percentage growth behind the at national average, even with our $1.1 billion average over the last uh, several years since the 2013 bill came into place. And the cost, to, the cost per job in, in, in the 1990s was about eight or 9,000 to, to create that job through the EDA. Then it went up to like somewhere in the mid-teens in the 2000s. Pre-2013, it was about 40,000. Now it's about $85,000 to create that job. The best tax incentive program, folks, would be a lower tax rate. Can I, then, can and I we need to change also the loss, if I may, just for a quick second, on, in addition to the lower consistent tax rate, you also, there were some things that were done two years ago, like getting rid of things with the, like the loss carry forward that we, that we used mm -hmm. to have, that is stopping business investment in the state of New Jersey to stand still in a lot of, a lot of businesses that we need to really change that back. And we also have regulatory issues. I have the Highlands up by us. We have a company located five miles from my house that produces one third of the polymers for automotive cable coatings. And they are right sited by the Norfolk Southern Railway in Mansfield Township. They're in the Highlands Preservation Area. Right on the other side of the Magical Railroad Track is the planning area. They tried to get expand, to expand their plant because they wanted a double capacity. You know where they built a new plant? They're, they're still here, thank God for now, but they built a new plant in North Carolina, Borealis Compounds. So those additional 150 jobs, and they still have the help wanted sign out. They pay all the benefits, they have the health insurance, the vacation, the type of jobs we want for people. Uh, in, in, in New Jersey, and, and, be, and because of regulations, they've gone, and now they're getting the benefit of the lower CBT as well. And I just wanted to add one thing over the last, I guess, 10 years. Uh, we've lost $20 billion worth of wealth. What comes in, comes out, you know, people say, we, you know, we're doing great. We're, we're actually losing money. And you look at other states like Florida, where Florida is not the number one state for people to leave New Jersey. It's New York. And when New Jersey gets more expensive than New York, New York's got a lot to offer. Mike, can I just add one thing? Of course. What troubles me the most uh, in all the statistics we see, and you know, as a 
as a business owner myself, as someone who represents businesses every day, you know, this the climate of 89% or whatever the number was of people that think New Jersey is too expensive. I think we have to be careful that we don't create a self-fulfilling prophecy. We saw this 10, 12 years ago with the medical society that said, oh, it was horrible to practice medicine, and we saw the next generation of doctors kind of weed away. We went through eight years with Governor Christie where it was no secret and during his presidential ambitions there was very little interest in increasing taxes in New Jersey. Uh, hopefully you've seen over the last two years that the Senate President, Speaker, and myself have pushed back on this governor on taxes that we believe makes New Jersey uncompetitive and lose that competitive advantage. To me, what I'm so interested in, when I listen to my friend Tom talk about Massachusetts and Pennsylvania is I don't think it's overly dramatic to say that we need a citizen's revolution in New Jersey. Um, the reality is the, st the statistic that troubles me the most is that 44% of New Jerseyans admit that they look to relocate out of New Jersey in the next 10 years. That 44%, they're not millionaires. You know, 44% of people that are looking to leave New Jersey, there's not 44% of our state that's millionaires. They are our children. They are senior citizens, they are empty nesters, they make up the biggest chunk of that $20 billion in lost revenue, and they are choosing to go to other states that give them greater stability. So I'm very interested in the tax structure in Pennsylvania. I am very interested when the governor talks about Massachusetts in the state of the state address and refers to it affectionately as Taxachusetts. The truth of the matter is, Businesses are swarming to Massachusetts in spite of what corporate business taxes they have because they are creative in creating tax incentives around research, development, technology, and that's what troubles me so much with Governor Murphy campaigned on something that I thought was brilliant based on New Jersey's base as an economic engine in STEM. And we seem to, he has abandoned that where I think everyone on this panel, regardless of party, would embrace tax reform around those programs. And for me personally, if we would embrace that along with a shakeup of a tax structure that is fundamentally broken in New Jersey, relying on property taxes unlike any other state in the country, and you watch people leave and go to states like Pennsylvania because it gives them greater stability than it does here. Well, everybody here, sorry, but everybody here brought up Massachusetts as an example, so I'll just I'll say that. Massachusetts, over the course of 10 years, invested a billion dollars in their STEM, their life sciences program. What are we doing here in New Jersey to compete? Because Massachusetts, and Governor Murphy did talk a lot about it during the campaign, he also very clearly said Massachusetts is not a low-tax state. You're talking about North Carolina. Well, I, would say, but, but, I, right. I think it's a great point in Massachusetts. One thing, remember, their, their top tax rate, too, is about half of New Jersey. It's, it's, it's right. 5.15 5. 5. 5. 5. 5. or 5.65. Like Actually, Massachusetts has reduced their tax rate by about 25 percent. So their model, the model that Massachusetts has with the incentives targeted, targeted with the universities, you know, surrounding universities. MIT, there's a billion and a half dollars of investment around MIT. That was hell of an investment. So, you know, putting the focus on our universities, and oh, by the way, our universities, even though we did a bond act for our universities, they're tired. They need to be upgraded. You know, we, we, we did a first step on it so that our kids are learning with the technologies we, you know, that they're working with today. Uh, but we don't have the dollars to make the investments that brings the other investments, and that's the biggest problem. That's why when I keep talking about change, we spend a lot of money in New Jersey. You realize that. We spend more than anywhere else. The money is there. It just needs to be <coughs> reshuffle, reshuffle the deck to put the money where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. Yeah. And when we talk about Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, they're flat tax states with local options. New, you know, New Jersey, we have this broken tax structure where we are using the property taxes to offset those other revenues. That is the most discriminatory tax that you can possibly have, which is why 47% of our millennial generation compared to one third nationally are living at home with mom and dad. And you're seeing this exodus of seniors that are leaving the state of New Jersey. You know, to me, I, I'm just at a point where when I look at all the things that we've done, again, in a bipartisan fashion, 
We did pension reform that saved the state billions of dollars. We did arbitration reform to level the negotiating table. We did property tax caps. We eliminated double dipper, dippers from the election process. We eliminated people from stacking their pensions in local municipalities. All of these and many, many others were sold as the solution to your property tax problem in New Jersey. And in spite of all of that, including the work that we all support on Path to Progress, nobody's property taxes have gone down. So unless we are willing to have an honest conversation around how do you change that dynamic, the money is here. It's just how we generate it and how we disperse it is fundamentally broken. I have, I have one and last Mike, question. If I could just add, add one more thing. Sure. That would, another thing. We invest a lot of money in the K-12 school system. I would say even if it's $15,000 a year, you're between $180,000 and $200,000 per child. A fair number. It could be more or less. And then they either go away to college and they find a state where there, there's a company that's co-located here in another state but the other states costs are less, the taxes are less, they say, I make the same salary, I'm going to go here. So we, we, we invest that $30 billion a year in, in the K through 12s at the local and the state level, and then some of it goes somewhere else. And also some of our kids that we, we subsidize to go to our, local, our state schools as well for college. And, and those investments we make are, are going to the lower tax states because they can raise their family on a similar salary for less taxes and less cost of living and live better. And who wouldn't? I, I got to follow up with him on that, John. I'm sorry, Mike, for a second. New Jersey has the second most expensive four-year public institutional system in the nation. Second most expensive. We invested 48%. We're 48th or 49th in investment. All the states around us have special ed tuition <coughs> rates for New Jersey kids. They're leaving because they can't afford to be here. We make education too expensive because we don't invest. To John's point, we spend so much in you know, pre-K to 12 to develop. New Jersey is a very intelligent state. There's more, there's more scientists, professors, and doctors than anywhere else in the country. But they leave because we send them away. Realize that every state around us, you can go, you can go to college cheaper than in New Jersey, your home state. And when you go away, you know, four or five years, most of those kids aren't coming back. Well, that's one last question, then we'll open it, open it to audience questions. I'll ask this to the group, maybe we'll start with the Senator. Uh, the Energy Master Plan is coming out soon. We've cited Massachusetts a few times in a positive way. One potential negative way is, is uh, they've constrained some of their infrastructure around lower cost energy <laughs> over the years to the point where they've actually, in cold snaps, have imported Russian liquefied natural gas, natural gas into their world. The, the Energy Master Plan is coming out. Uh, in the survey of the NJBIA, only 5% of people, business folks in New Jersey, said our energy costs were uh, better than other states. Um, I think there's a concern about, uh, while some of the goals are laudable around renewable energy, some concerns about the prices. So any thoughts on uh, energy in terms of the costs and how that affects business going yeah, forward? Mike, I'm a pro energy. I'm, I'm pro energy. I'm not anti-gas. I'll be honest with you. I'm not anti-gas. I'm the prime sponsor of REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. I was the prime sponsor of the SREX for solar in the Senate, and I was the prime sponsor of offshore wind. I'm pro alternative energy, but you need gas to get you to the other side when these, when these, when these energies, these new developments of energies are going to be more affordable, more you know, I mean, more reachable. It's like the flat screen TV when it first came out; they were four thousand dollars. Now you get one for a few hundred bucks. We need, we need the affordable energy to get to the other side. And starving it and shutting it down is going to create situations like in New York, is it uh, Westchester County, whatever it is? Westchester in Brooklyn, yeah. They had to shut down any development because they don't have gas. They don't have energy. So look, I, I, I'm telling you, we have to have a diverse portfolio of energy. And what we need really is gas to bring costs down because Besides taxes in New Jersey, I read their surveys too. The number two, the number two issue in New Jersey after taxes is energy cost. So you know what I mean, Mike. You, you can't just shut off the cheaper stuff and just make it more expensive because that's what we're doing. I guess we have time for a few questions from the audience, unless anybody wants to pine on that as well. Nah, that's one no one likes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on the page. Build it. Uh, terrific panel, thank you. Uh, 
report, and I was excited when it came out. Um, I thought a lot of the solutions there were the right solutions in the right direction. Um, you did address in that report cost savings and cost structure. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was where you had the greatest opportunity for upside. To truly examine the cost structure of the state. Shared services, great idea. Pulling health care plan for state employees, municipal, county, uh, from premier into a gold. Great ideas, incremental, politically doable. But I was looking for some more uh, participation, and I still am, from the business community, and that's why I'm glad you're all here. I love what you've done in, in Camden. I love the approach and philosophy about incentives. I support 95% of what you're talking about on a bipartisan level. But I'm concerned, as a business person who uh, attracts people from Rutgers and College of New Jersey to my marketing firm, we train them, and they leave for Philadelphia and New York within 18 months to two years. And it's because they want to live there. Uh, they want to live there because they see more opportunity and they can't live at home. So you've pointed out that structure, but my question to you really would be to do with uh, how can we accelerate the cost savings and get that curve down on a longer term trend and what more creative things can we do? Can we do things like what the private sector are doing? You know, not just a premium to a gold plan, but push people where the market wants to be. Young people want to be in the silver plan and they want to be in health savings accounts because then they have flexibility to save that money toward retirement or toward discretionary uh, things. So I'm, I'm looking for another phase of Path to Progress, phase two, with uh, 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 to re and you did a great job with the first one. We got to get more than implemented. What are the priorities to take Path to Progress, A, to, 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 to accelerate cost structure reduction, and two, to continue the innovation. Looking for, looking for Path Progress 2.0 already, Senator. <laughs> no, well, I've got to get 1.0 first. <laughs> but, but the point is, <coughs> we need engagement. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember the network movie where the anchor goes out and yells, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. I hear people say they're fed up with taxes in the state. I hear it every single day. We put a plan together. We do town hall meetings. The only people to show up are the public sector workers to try to, you know, shout us and yell us down and try to intimidate us. And I don't know if you know about my personality, you're not going to intimidate me. <laughs> In fact, it motivates me to do more. Uh, but my point is, until people really engage and say they want something different, this has to be bipartisan, and it is bipartisan. Anything meaningful that is going to change the dial, improve the state, is going to be bipartisan. Because we can't do it just as Democrats. It's just not possible. We need to do it together. Uh, you know, we did reforms in 10 and 11, and they're not enough. But that's what we could get done back then. You know, I look back at it, and I tell people, I wish I had made the property tax cap zero. Christie had had it at two and a half, and I, brought, I was going to sit too. But looking at it now, and understanding how things work from the local level, governments will figure things out. They will figure things out if you set the goal. Just like school districts telling me, we'll do consolidation if you make us. Because you know, we don't want anybody mad at us, but we don't disagree with you. And the School Boards Association has been great to work with, and they're working with us to try to bring people together. And we want to highlight some successes of school consolidation. So, you know, like, the world's not going to come to an end. Uh, change to change isn't the right thing to do, but change to improve is very important. You know, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. I had a little community called Winona in my county. They want to consolidate police departments. Well, as soon as they did it, you know, officers off duty in uniform knocking on the door. Mr. Sweeney, we put this sign up, please save our police department. Now, how many morons wouldn't put that sign up, right? The police officers that protected me is asking me to do it. Well, they put it up for a vote, they voted, they were going to save $400 a household. They put it up for a vote, it went down 60 40. They had their chance to save. They had the courage to come back a few years later, and they said, to hell with it. They did it. 
They moved the meetings to the school because the building wasn't big enough. People with pitchforks yelling and hollering. They did it. The change happened. The next day, the sun came up. <laughs> the world was fine. <laughs> the police came when you called them. You know what I mean? It's like, we just got to get beyond the fear. It's like school consolidation when you say, well, what are you against? Well, I'm against what you're talking about, but you don't know what I'm talking about because I didn't put anything in front of you to criticize. You can criticize me if I give you something to look at, but to be against something without knowing what it is, you know, it's kind of backwards. So it's really getting the public more understanding of we can do a hell of a lot better than what we're doing. I think we have time for probably one last, one last question. I've got one. You guys know it. Can you guys hear me? Is this on? Yep, go ahead. Uh, my name is Darren McConey. Nice to meet you. A lot of good information from the panel. I'm, I'm actually a student, grad student at Rutgers, and I'm here to kind of represent them. Uh, I have my own internet company, and I run an uh, entrepreneurship innovation, and Rutgers is kind of our hub, and there's a huge pull. Is that better? Oh my God. <laughs> um, my age. I'm Italian, so I was trying to speak as loudly as possible there. So there's a huge pull from students at Rutgers. That's kind of my experience there. And we have, you know, there's 50,000 students alone there um, to be entrepreneurs. And there's just a general interest. And it, it doesn't have to be a full-time business, but to do something that they endeavor to succeed in. And uh, I actually won the Rutgers business plan competition through good mentorship, and it was just kind of exposed to me. So the single thing I see every day asked by me from our members, uh, partners, sponsors is, uh, what can I do to succeed? And, it's, and I'm not trying to be generic, but when they move to, to Philadelphia or New York, it's not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to, because that's where the resources are. Because the only thing that's on their mind is, where, where am I most likely to succeed? But there's, there's a great affection for New Jersey. So my question is, with that understanding, what would you like to see from students or, for, or from organizations like mine or Rutgers where they would help you make the change or to get those in place, right? What, what can we do to show or help or to kind of move it along fast? Does that make sense? Like, yes. what Sorry, do you need from us? Want to go first? Or sure. Want to go sure. Uh, well, you, I think you need to, you know, especially on, on the internet, you need to make the voices, you know, echo and, 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 and loud. And you need to show um, how do you tie the nonprofit, the government, the higher education way, and the entrepreneur way. Because we are an innovative state. That's our legacy. It's our future. Um, you need to understand that things like the independent contractor bill that people are now trying to push through the, the legislature is the wrong way to go. And we need to block, block that bill in this lame duck or in any session because I think that will actually deter innovation and entrepreneurship in this, in this state. And so we, we, everybody needs to get engaged to block those types of pieces of legislation. You need to make sure that the younger voters or sometimes the, you know, aren't, don't vote as frequently as other, um, other generations do. So making sure that starting at 18 on, that people are voting in every election, they're, that they're you know, participating in our democracy, because that's another way to have your, your voice heard. Showing up in every way that you can. Say there are great innovative ideas that, that every generation can, can go forward, and you can be ahead of the ideas for you know, other postdoctoral research fellowships that, that make sense. Well, is there a manufacturing hurdle? What are other states doing from a tax perspective that is allowing for, for more and more people to participate in the economy? And what is predictable? What can we do to make sure that for the next five years you're paying attention here to the next 10 years that you're paying here? And making sure that, that your peers at Rutgers and every other university is participating locally and, and globally. Because right now a lot of people just say, I'm participating and it's, a, and it's, a, it's a global participation. But you also need to understand that the way you're going to make a difference is helping your next door neighbors and saying, I, this is how I can invest in this local change. And you can have your voice heard here at home, which is, is extraordinarily important. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, congratulations to you, because I think you can see there aren't a lot of students in, in your realm that have taken the time to be at an event like this today. So you should be applauded for that. Uh, I relate very much to where you are. I have three children your age that are all in college. And I think you, know, you used the word resource. Uh, 
I think what would be helpful to us would be when you say that your peers are going to Philadelphia because of the resources that are being provided to them, that to us is what is that competitive advantage that other states are using to attract you. So when earlier in our comments when I said I support the governor's initiative for tax incentives for small business and entrepreneurial spirit, that's why I do. And I assume that one of the components that attracts young people like yourself and your colleagues to Philadelphia are some of those tax incentives around those programs. What I would like to see is how do we attract your entrepreneurial spirit and what your business is to some of the successful businesses that we have attracted at the top end and to partner you guys together so that you're growing together and feed off of each other. Uh, I will say, you know, to the previous questioner and to you as well, I, from my experience and watching my children's generation and looking at reports out of the Rand Institute and affiliate of Rutgers, your great university, when we looked at when we looked at uh, a workforce in South Jersey that was 31 years of age and older, making $75,000 a year or more, 31 and older, $75,000 a year or more, 70% of that classification was relocating to Philadelphia. And they were choosing Philadelphia, I believe, because when I was that age, my wife and I built a home in Voorhees on half an acre, and I, I, if my life depended on it, sir, I couldn't tell you what I paid in sales tax last year. I couldn't tell you. I can tell you to the penny what I pay in property taxes. And I can tell you what I paid when I built my house. And I can tell you the incremental increases. And I can tell you over 20 years that it is more than doubled. And what I know for you, young man, and for my children, which, which unnerves me, is that when I built that house when I was 28, I know that a 28-year-old Greenwald family today can't afford that house. So it's, it's not, there are two tracks that we're on here. One is New Jersey's business climate and how do we create a tax structure that is competitive for you to grow here, incentivize you to stay here. But the other truly is this property tax crisis where people have a choice. And if you're a young person, we chose that suburban community because of the public education system and we wanted to be near our history and our culture and what we loved. When I hear you say, we love New Jersey. But at the end of the day, if you have a choice between cutting your out-of-pocket expense by 40, 50%, you know, John said this earlier, it's 100% true. You are eventually going to make decisions that are in your best interest and your family's best interest. So to me, Path to Progress 2.0 is that citizen's revolution on how do you attack this property tax crisis and how do you marry that with tax incentives, not just for the high end, but for young people like yourself. And again, I will say, whatever those incentives are that other states, in particular Pennsylvania, are offering for entrepreneurs, small businesses, we want to know what they are so we can compete. And we embrace that with the governor. But it's not an either or to us. It is a complete package and a solution to problems. How can we tell you what those are? Come see us. My staff's right in the back of the room. He's going to come get your card. And, you know, and. <laughs> I think, I think one thing, and I know we've, I know we've got to wrap up, I, I, I think one thing that, uh, one thing you've heard from everyone up here is they, they, they want to hear what you think, they want to hear voices heard, Senator Sweeney just said, we to town hall events, the only people who show up are organized opposition, um, and I can say, having worked in government and politics all these years, Julie as well, elected officials listen, and they listen a lot more than probably the average people think, I think everybody here probably knows that, but to spread that word and just make your voices heard because ultimately they, they want to be responsive, so I appreciate your, your time here and your questions and I encourage you to continue to do so and ask others to do so. Yeah, this is great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.